The countdown is on in Europe. This is Bloomberg Markets European Close with Guy Johnson and Alex Steele. Friday the 6th, 30 minutes to the European close. What do you need to know? Well, a day after the Bank of England signals its policy tightening is on the way. A KPMG survey shows UK starting salaries are now rising at their fastest rate in 24 years. It's not just happening over in the States. It's definitely happening here in Europe as well. Fortress raising its offer for the UK supermarket group Morrison's. The move piling pressure on CDNR to deliver a counter bid ahead of an August 9th deadline. And the London Stock Exchange sees its stock surge after telling investors that the definitive investigation, investig sorry, integration, not investigation, back on track. <laughs> Let's Nearly got it. Let's talk about the markets, Taylor. Let me just show you what's happening here in Europe, then you can tell us what's happening stateside. Um, European stocks are higher. We're actually heading for the best week since March. That's the kind of story we're watching here. However, and we'll broaden the shots out and you can see what's happening. We are seeing weaker currencies on this side of the Atlantic. The dollar is bid, Taylor. Oh, indeed it is, guys. You can see here on the bottom of my screen, we're up about six tenths of 1%, a little bit of that dollar strengthening. It's not a safe haven kind of day. It's a concern now about if the Fed starts to move a little bit sooner than we think. Of course, we know data dependent. One report doesn't change the game, but a lot of comments now about why are we in emergency conditions if the emergency is over. So that pull forward is certainly, of course, what might be moving the dollar today. Let's climb our way up because Bond yields, guy. I know this is something I get excited about. Can eight basis points get you excited too? This is a one day move, rate of change. We're now back up to a 194 as we try to eye that 2% level on the 30 year. And indeed, when yields are climbing, we see NASDAQ 100 getting hit the hardest. It's a Dow Jones, it's an S&P kind of day, it's a Russell 2000 kind of day as we think about some of these travel and these reopening stocks underway. Absolutely. I, I am excited about that move, but oh, I, it's interesting that it's been going on for a couple of days. Yeah, of course, <laughs> it's, it's the bond market, it's the treasury market. Of course, you've got to be excited, particularly on payrolls day. But it happened a couple of days ago as well. We've seen this kind of swift turnaround uh, in terms of the narrative. Rich Clarida also driving some of that move as well. But today's payroll figure, certainly a big part of that narrative, a very, very strong number. Earlier, we heard from the U.S. Labor Secretary, Marty Walsh. He weighed in on these numbers. We're seeing our economy moving forward. Uh, we're seeing people going back into all sectors. It's not just leisure and hospitality, although that was our biggest gain again this month. But we saw people in education and, and uh, government education and also in manufacturing. So we're starting to see different sectors getting busy as well. I think in some sectors, we're definitely going to need to see higher wage growth for people to come back to work. Uh, but, but I think where we're headed right now, I mean, all signs are incrementally going in, in a good, positive direction. A strong number. In a moment, we're going to hear from the president. Right now, we're going to hear from Jeff Yu, Bank of New York Mellon, senior EMEA market strategist. Jeff, it was a really, really good number. Um, and the revision last month was pretty solid as well. What does it mean for investors? Uh, well, for investors, it means that we are on track um, for further clarity over Fed normalization, over tapering. Uh, so uh, Jackson Hole becomes uh, the key date uh, for the calendars uh, for the rest of uh, the uh, summer, really, as uh, from the dollar's reaction, uh, we can see, uh, you know, can we maintain this balance of uh, sort of being risk on, but also uh, having dollar advance as well. Correlations have been whipping around them of late. Uh, but overall, I think this is going to be a pretty benign environment. Uh, and I think the main takeaway is also, um, after all that's said and done over the last two weeks, concerns over the Delta variant, uh, that hidden growth from globally, we're not really there yet, right? So, uh, uh, the uh, course for normalization and economic recovery, we're still um, investing for that. Jeff, it's interesting. It's Rick Reader over at BlackRock hinting in his latest note, questioning why we're in emergency conditions when the emergency is over. What, how do you think about that? Uh, well, I think the main challenge uh, for uh, central banks right now is uh, that a combination of the monetary and fiscal policy is still treating as if we have emergency conditions. And there's just so much uncertainty over what's going to happen um, up ahead. And I draw attention to what the RBA did uh, recently. They specifically said that 
uh, this latest wave in Australia is um, going to end um, in the upcoming quarters. You know, but no central bank really wants to actually pin down a specific time for health conditions to improve, for society to actually normalise. So in that context, we're still in, in, um, uh, still in uh, emergency conditions. And until fiscal is fully withdrawn or fully normalised, you can say that overall financial and fiscal conditions, they are sort of in emergency settings as well. And that makes policymaking difficult. Euro dollar below 118, got a 117.60 handle. How much stronger does the dollar get if this data continues to come in like it is? Uh, well, I'm still going to take the other side of that. Um, actually, I think a reflation is underbaked in Europe. It's actually underappreciated. Um, if um, and uh, maybe we we, uh, we should be agreeing on, uh, on this. Uh, if the uh, so-called British experiment is going to work, you know, probably Europe is actually going to take heart from that and go for it next. Learning to live with the virus, uh, even some corners of the Chinese establishment are actually thinking about it openly. Uh, so that means uh, Europe is probably going to follow the UK in enjoying this recovery wave, this normalisation wave for society. And heading into September, given how the German elections are, could work out right now, I think reflation is really underappreciated in Europe right now. So euro dollar actually has upside. With that inflation, it's been a key theme, of course, that we are all global central banks letting this inflation run hot. In that case, are we fully invested in these equity markets as bonds are giving us a negative return on a post-inflation basis? Uh, well, I think given the pace of normalization um, right now, so whatever the Fed is going to do when it lays out its uh, tapering, so the pace at which they are going to first stabilize balance sheets, stabilize liquidity provision, and then start to withdraw liquidity, uh, perhaps, I think this is going to happen at a pace which equity markets are going to be very, very comfortable with. But also for bond markets, bond markets you know, don't like these sudden jolts, uh, which we saw in March and also in June. So if it can be a slow unwinding of liquidity from the Fed and allow the private sector allow investors to actually come back in to uh, supplant uh, the uh, central bank, I think we can actually take that as well. So um, dare we say uh, Goldilocks, you know, after today, you know, perhaps uh, that can run on for a few weeks yet. I spoke to the governor of the Bank of England yesterday. His big concern, it seems, is second round effects in the labour market. Were you surprised that the bank has turned in the way that it has towards tightening? I, it, it feels like it's going to be a, a way off and it feels like it's going to be fairly gradual. But nevertheless, all eyes now at the Bank of England on that, on that kind of tightening process, be it tapering or tightening. Yes, um, I, I was a bit surprised at how much they actually laid out the scene because I was expecting um, Governor Bailey, and I don't think he's discounted this um, yet, to actually wait for the furlough programme to um, actually roll off and before uh, really making a judgment on the labour market right now. We still have, a good, um, are based on the latest data, up uh, to a million um, uh, people on the furlough. So that is not a normalised labour market. That's fiscal support uh, keeping labour markets in a place you know, where normally it wouldn't be. You know, going back to uh, the earlier point about emergency settings, um, about uh, fiscal uh, injection into the US as well. So that's where we don't have a normalized picture yet. So for the BOE to actually preempt pre that and lay out so specifically a new guidance, when to taper, when to actually sell assets, that was the most hawkish takeaway for me, really. Um, no central bank, very few, are talking about selling that, so, uh, uh, accelerating the balance sheet rundown right now. So I think that actually sets the BOE apart right now. What are global, though, negative real yields telling you? Well, global negative real yields are still saying that we have a long way to go um, before fulfilling potential growth. And the one thing I'm worried about, which I don't think the market's discounting enough yet, is China and Asia. Very little good news um, coming through. Uh, we've all been caught up in this regulatory wave, what's going on in the equity market. Very few people are talking about what's happened with the triple R cut, the need for, for um, further liquidity release in China. And now um, with a new round um, of the Del uh, Delta variant, um, it's probably the most serious um, uh, spread of the pandemic in China uh, the, uh, uh, this year. Uh, so that's going to uh, jeopardize already soft um, household sentiment. So China's going to be a drag on growth up ahead. I don't think the world's actually appreciating that. Um, I don't think the world's appreciating it, uh, that enough yet. Jeff, you always so smart there of BNY Mellon. Really appreciate your time. And Guy, coming up, it's been a big earnings season for some of your European banks. We've seen beating expectations, boosting those outlooks and that forward guidance. Let's do it all and let's do it more next. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on the Bloomberg First World News. I'm Rishka Gupta. 
The Senate is heading towards a weekend vote on its $550 billion infrastructure legislation. Yesterday, senators huddled on and off the floor to discuss final changes to the bill, which is 2,700 pages long. Even if the bill is passed, it faces an uncertain future in the House. Singapore will take advantage of having one of the best vaccination rates in the world. The Southeast Asian Trade Center announced plans to ease COVID restrictions on daily life. It will also begin slightly loosening border controls. Two-thirds of Singapore's population is now fully vaccinated. And in the UK, starting salaries surge at the fastest pace in at least 24 years. Pay for new hires reflects increasing competition for staff to fill jobs that open with the loosening of pandemic restrictions. British companies from retailers to construction firms are struggling to fill gaps in their workforce. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg Guy. Ritika, thank you very much indeed. ING, the latest European bank to report numbers and a bright outlook. Uh, it posted second quarter earnings that beat expectations. Basically, it follows a string of upside surprises uh, that have the, uh, the financial C-suites here in Europe teeming with optimism. We see no uh, uh, deterioration going forward for the coming quarters. We are at a very low historically cost of risk. What we see going forward is that this should remain at least for the year. Overall, we think um, that um, we will um, um, definitely um, continue this trend um, in, the, in the next six months. You see volumes going up. If you look, it's everywhere in our European environment. And therefore, we stick to our guidance that revenues this year will be slightly um, above last year's revenues. And I would say the level of business activity continues to remain pretty robust. Our economic outlook is increasingly positive and we're seeing sentiment amongst our customers now back to pre-pandemic levels. Strong performance across all of our businesses and as we come out of lockdown, consumer spending is starting to recover back to pre-COVID levels. What we've seen so far this year is uh, capital to con continue to accrete uh, much into a much better place than where we thought we'd be at this point. Joining us now, Bloomberg's Tom Metcalf. He leads coverage here in Europe of the European banking sector. Tom, let's talk about what we've seen this reporting season. An incredibly positive message being delivered from the C-suite. What we seem to be seeing is finally evidence that the European banks have turned a corner, that we've moved uh, from this kind of net interest story that has been the kind of historical narrative to a more distributed, more fee-based story that really is starting to generate some really positive momentum. Yeah, well, that's certainly the messages those executives were putting across. And that, and that was a, a great clip. It was a real chorus of optimism, which, you know, been covering this for a while now. You don't normally see that, like, across the board. I mean, that was from... Paris to Milan uh, to London. So absolutely, there's a lot of very positive noises. And I think the question in people's minds, you know, maybe, maybe the investors take a bit more sceptical look is, you know, is this the long term kind of exit from, as you say, a pretty bleak past? Or is it more short term? And we're looking at kind of these hefty releases of provisions kind of covering perhaps, you know, the, the cracks in European banking. Tom, what's interesting is within here in the U.S. as we're recapping and sort of ending our big earning season, about 30 percent of companies are cutting the forward guidance, saying that, well, maybe the peak growth is behind us. What is the level of pessimism in your Europe as well? Yeah, I mean, definitely hearing that from certain shareholders and, and you know, it's, it's kind of half of one, half of the other. So it's hard to tell. But um, I mean, yeah, when you look at the U.S., I think it's definitely fair to say they're in a stronger position than the European banks. Uh, we did a story recently looking at, you know, it's been the most profitable year for banks across across the world the last 12 months. And right at the top of the tree there was J.P. Morgan made something like, I think, $50 billion of profit um, through to June. So uh, incredible numbers. But uh I don't think there's clarity yet on whether that can be sustained. Tom, the, the, the authorities in the United States are taking a more optimistic view. They're allowing a significant return of money to shareholders. The ECB is taking a more ca cautious stance. Do you think this set of earnings will start to change hearts and minds in Frankfurt? Do you think actually we could see a review of what is going on in terms of the ability of these banks to return money to shareholders? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of cautious messaging coming out of the ECB. So, you know, whereas it's sort of hands off from the Fed and, and to a bit of a less extent, the B of E, the ECB is still saying, 
hey, you know, be very cautious. You don't know what's around the corner. Um, but to be fair to them, come the end of September, those restrictions, at least if their time frame, they keep to it, uh, they should be lifted. So sort of by the end of this year, you'd expect, you know, the banks have been back in full control of their uh, shareholder payouts. And then it becomes a question of just how sort of uh, kind of gung ho or how, how closely they're feeling these animal spirits in terms of the size of the payouts. Tom, it's interesting. We also got numbers, quarterly results from the London Stock Exchange Group. And I am curious the tone of just broader capital markets as you're getting massive liquidity and the tailwinds, but then the headwinds of still virus concerns out there. Yeah, LSE, uh, very strong results today. I think the last time I checked it, shares were up something like 6%. Uh, and you, you guys had the CEO on today and he was talking about London's listing market and saying, look, it's just a great time to be in London because, you know, companies are out there trying to raise money. It's a hot IPO market. Uh, so, again, very positive noises coming from uh, that stock exchange operator. And we saw something similar with Euronext, the big pan-European operator. So all the messaging, all the sort of historic data is, you know, this has been a great time to be in the capital markets. Uh, and yeah, obviously, the, the big question is, what does Q3 look like? What does Q4 look like? Especially if perhaps, you know, these very generous government support programs start to tail off. Tom, the, the big story around the LSE is also today the, the kind of the story around Refinitiv and the acquisition um, that they closed at the beginning of the year. There was some concern last quarter that maybe that was going off track. The costs were going to be significantly higher than maybe anticipated. Is the message today that it's back on track? Yeah, I think that's a fair way to look at it. So that certainly surprised the market on the upside. Basically, the LSE came out and said, hey, we've actually extracted more cost savings in the first half of the year than we originally sort of forecast. Um, so, and, you know, I think that's what has been driving the share price today for sure. It's obviously a you know, massive deal, $27 billion, going to take you know, months, even years to properly integrate. But certainly in terms of the messaging coming out of out of the bourse, that's that's very positive, and you could tell from David Schwimmer, the CEO, he was he was very happy to be delivering that message, having sort of seen his share price drop by something like a fifth when he kind of first went out there and warned the market, oh, this might be a bit more expensive than we're expecting. Tom Metcalf of Bloomberg News, thank you there as always, and Guy, you know that we're doing it every time. We'll do our disclosure here, Bloomberg LP, the parent company of Bloomberg News, it does compete with Refinitiv in providing financial news data and information. And of course, Guy, it is jobs day here. We want to take a look at a live shot of the East Room in the White House. All as we're awaiting President Joe Biden to deliver remarks on that U.S. jobs report. Again, the numbers 943,000 coming in well ahead of expectations. And you're getting last month's revised numbers higher. This is Bloomberg. You're looking at a live shot of the East Room at the White House. We are awaiting President Biden. He's going to be delivering remarks on the jobs report. Let's listen to what the president has to say. What a good morning. Yesterday, the United States Senate took the additional step toward passing the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill. It's a bill that would end years of gridlock in Washington and create millions of good-paying jobs and put America on a new path to win the race for the economy in the 21st century. The historic investment in roads and rail and transit and bridges and clean energy and clean water will enable us not only to build back, but to build back better than before the economic crisis hit. I want to thank the bipartisan group of senators for working together and the committee chairs for raising their ideas and concerns with me, and Vice President Harris, and members of our cabinet. As you did with the Transcontinental Railroad and the Interstate Highway System, we'll soon once again transform America and propel us into the future. This bill makes key investments to put people to work all across the country in cities, in towns, in rural communities, small towns, big towns, a coast line, along the coastlines and on the plains. It covers the nation. And it's going to put America to work in good-paying union jobs, building and repairing our roads, bridges, ports, airports. And, you know, 
once this bill passes the Senate, I know that body will move toward establishing a framework for the remainder of my Build Back Better agenda. And giving tax cuts to the middle class by investing in child care and home care for seniors, critical investments to combat climate change and to build a clean energy future, vital steps needed to bring down the cost of health care, and so much more. We're going to do it without raising taxes by even one cent on people making less than $400,000 a year. And here's another important part of the bill. 90% of the jobs created by this legislation will not require a college degree, 90%. It's a blue-collar blueprint to rebuild America. Which brings me to another piece of good news this morning. We learned that the economy created 943,000 new jobs in July. 943,000. The unemployment rate fell by a half a percent to 5.4%. Now, while our economy is far from complete, and while we doubtlessly will have ups and downs along the way as we continue to battle the Delta surge of COVID, what is indisputable now is this. The Biden plan is working. The Biden plan produces results, and the Biden plan is moving the country forward. We're now the first administration in history to add jobs every single month on our first six months in office, and the only one in history to add more than 4 million jobs during the first six months. Economic growth is the fastest in 40 years. Jobs are up. The unemployment rate is the lowest since the pandemic hit. Black unemployment is down as well. Why? Because we put in place the necessary tools early in my presidency. The COVID vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine plan, the American Rescue Plan to fight the virus and fight the economic mess we inherited. As a result, we've been able to make progress on both fronts against grave challenges. And we have we put in place the tools to prevent this Delta variant wave. COVID-19, from shutting down our small businesses, our schools, and our society. You know, when we first got to office, COVID-19 crisis and economic crisis were unrelenting and devastating for people. And as a nation, we didn't have the tools to deal with either. Nearly 4,000 Americans were dying each and every day to the virus, 4,000 a day. The economy had been wiped out. We were down 10 million jobs from where we were before the pandemic. We were in a dark winter with real concerns about what spring would bring. But then we got to work. We passed the American Rescue Plan shortly after I was sworn in. It gave us the tools to fight the pandemic and rebuild our economy. And it produced results. To beat the pandemic, we ramped up testing and protective equipment. And we bought it. We bought. We actually went out and bought enough vaccine so that every single solitary American could be vaccinated. And because of the help of everyone, from the military to civilian efforts, we carried out one of the most difficult logistical challenges in our nation's history: to get 220 million shots in the people's arms in the first 100 days in office. 220 million. Over the past seven months, we've cut COVID-19 deaths by 90 percent. As of today, 193 million Americans have gotten at least one vaccination shot, including over 70 percent of adults over the age of 18. 165 million Americans are now fully vaccinated. Because of our success with the vaccination effort, this new Delta variant wave of COVID-19 will be very different to be able to deal with than the one that, under, that we under, uh, was underway when I took office. And yes, cases are going to go up before they come back down. It's a pandemic of the unvaccinated. I know I've said that constantly, and others have as well. The vaccination of the unvaccinated. You know, and it's needless taking a needless toll on our country. You know, we have uh, roughly 350 million people vaccinated in the United States and billions around the world, and virtually no one's died because of that vaccination. 
But even so, the impact is going to be very different than what happened last January. Today, about 400 people will die because of the Delta variant in this country. A tragedy, because virtually all of these deaths were preventable if people had gotten vaccinated. But seven months ago today, almost 4,000 people died on that very day from COVID-19. 4,000 versus 400. That shows how much our vaccination progress has already done to protect us from the worst of the new Delta COVID-19 wave. Likewise, the American Rescue Plan has given us the economic tools we need to protect our recovery against the worst impacts of the Delta virus. 1,400 checks into the pockets, for $1,400 checks into the pockets of millions of Americans help to keep their folks in their homes, help to put food on the table. Remember those long lines we used to talk about? People lined up in their cars for hours just to get a box of food put in their trunk? Help the small businesses so they keep the lights on, their doors open, and their employees on the job because states were losing revenue, they were having to lay off essential workers. Well, the aid to states and cities and counties and tribes that kept essential workers going, police officers, firefighters, educators, on the job. Funding for schools to reopen and ventilation systems, sanitation services, protective equipment to keep students and staff safe. And as we vaccinated America, we developed our economic tools to help our economy recover. As a result, in the past three months, we've created, on average, 832,000 new jobs per month since sworn in. That's compared to 50,000 jobs in the last three months of the previous administration. Look, even so, my message today is not one of celebration. It's one to remind us we've got a lot of hard work left to be done, both to beat the Delta variant and to continue our advance of economic recovery. We all know it's what it starts with. But I said again and again, this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. So we have to get more people vaccinated. I said, well over, what's the number again? I remind myself, 350 million Americans have already been vaccinated. They're doing fine. I'm pleased to report the past week we've seen the first time vaccinations in America go up by 4 million people getting back, 4 million shots. That's more than we've seen in a long time. I want to thank the governors. I listened to the governor of Maryland today on the, on the television. He's doing a heck of a job. Democratic governors as well. Republican governors. They're getting the word out. Look, as you all know, I put in place new incentives and requirements to encourage vaccinations. For example, federal workers will be asked to attest to their vaccination status. Anyone who does not attest or is not vaccinated will be required to wear a mask no matter where they work, test one or two times a week, socially distance, and generally will not be allowed to travel for work. There will be more to come in the days ahead. Once again, I want to thank the local leaders in the private sector, leaders who are imposing vaccine requirements. America can beat the Delta variant, just as we beat the original COVID-19. We can do this. So wear a mask when recommended. Get vaccinated today. All of that will save lives. And it means we're not going to have the same kind of economic damage we've seen when COVID-19 began. But we aren't stopping there. The American Rescue Plan was built knowing the recovery would take time, that there'd be ups and downs. So let me outline today six specific actions people will see over the next few weeks <clears throat> to make sure that we fight the Delta variant and wait for new vaccinations to be finished and keep our, our economy strong. First, <clears throat> thanks to the latest middle-class tax cut in a long time, the next monthly check, that is the child tax credit, 
In the next month, next nine days, checks are going to, all going to go out to almost 40 million families with children in nine days, beginning of next month, or the, the, the middle of this month, I should say. On August 15th, for example, a family with two young kids under the age of seven is going to get a check for $600 paid immediately. And they get a check next week, next month for $600, etc. If you're a family with two kids between the ages of 7 and 17, you're going to get a check for $500, 250 per child. And that will continue month after month. Second, I've looked ahead. We've looked ahead. And now schools have the resources they need to safely reopen as school year starts again so that every child can be in school full-time, safe, and this year. Third, we provided months ago states and localities with $45 billion in their coffers, the state and localities, to help renters and landlords to keep people in their homes and keep the local economy strong. That money has to get out now. I'm urging all local officials to get that money out. And we're going to send more help to small businesses on Main Street so the Delta variant doesn't cause them to lay off employees and shutter their doors. There's something called the Paycheck Protection Program. It's a loan program. Forgivable if the small business kept their employees in the job and their doors open. We're now in the process to forgive those loans for small businesses who are doing the right thing, putting them in a better position to keep their businesses going. Fifth, if anyone's worried about getting health insurance during the pandemic, there's help today. For those who get their health insurance through the Affordable Care Act, we're covering more people with more extensive benefits with premiums that average 40 percent lower. If you don't have insurance, you can still sign up under the Affordable Care Act through August the 15th. Just go to healthcare.gov today. And sixth, we're going to lower the prices on everything from prescription drugs to hearing aids by allowing businesses to compete, which will give them more choices at lower cost. For example, you're not going to have to go to a doctor to get a prescription to get a hearing aid. You're going to go right to the counter of the store and buy it over the counter. The bottom line is this. What we're doing is working, but don't take my word for it. Forecasters on Wall Street project over the next 10 years, our economy will expand by trillions of dollars and will create 2 million more jobs a year, good paying jobs. We just have to keep going. And it's simple. That means get vaccinated, please. It's safe. It works. We'll save lives and maybe save your life. As I said before, this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated. So please get vaccinated. We can get this done. We just have to stay the course. We just have to remember who we are. You've heard me say it before. We're the United States of America. There's not a single thing, nothing beyond our capacity when we do it together. God bless you all. May God protect our troops and have a good weekend. Thank you. Mr. President, to what extent is the economic recovery at risk if the Delta variant continues to spread and people don't get vaccinated? You've been listening to the president, President Biden, speaking at the East Room at the White House, talking about, amongst other things, the July payroll report, but also Taylor talking about his priorities going forward, urging Americans to get vaccinated as he sees the Delta variant continue to sweep across states where many people are unvaccinated. He's putting a big emphasis on that. Uh, as you highlighted, some good news within there, certainly for parents, uh, not only in terms of the checks that they're going to be receiving, but also good news uh, when it comes to schools staying open come the fall as well. That's going to be critical to keep this labour market, the trajectory we're seeing on track. Parents need kids to go back to school so they can go to work. And, Guy, you know, you have to say it is good news because just in this week, right, it's Wells Fargo, it's BlackRock, it's Amazon, at least on the corporate world, pushing back that return to work given the Delta variant that's risen back up again. And so there was some chatter of what do you do with schools. So really important, of course, as you mentioned, 
the president coming out and saying that schools have the tools that they need so everyone can go back to school. I think that was in part what the markets were getting a little bit nervous about as we talked about the rising cases. And speaking of rising cases, I think the president really hinting that cases are rising. And again, we heard this from the Expedia CEO. You're hearing this from the corporate world, but death rates among the vaccinated staying very low. So how do you learn to live with this as long as the death rate and hospitalization stay low, even if cases are rising? That could be secondary effect to looking at perhaps death rates and hospitalizations. Guy, just quickly to wrap it up, one more key thing that struck my mind as he thinks about the infrastructure bill here in the U.S. as we're waiting for that this weekend. Is it approved? Highlighting a lot about Main Street, the PPP loans, trying to work to make those fully forgivable. I know that that has been a key lifeline for some of these small businesses as long as they retain some of those employees. Yeah, critical, absolutely critical for those businesses. Um, what, I, what I thought was interesting as well is that, that he's not stopping. We, we think about the debate that is happening. The Fed, on the one hand, is being increasingly urged by many, including Joe Manchin, yeah, to, to think huge. about the process of removing stimulus. But on the other hand, you've got the president saying, we're not done yet. We're, we are a long way away from being done. We're going to carry on with this process. And it's going to be interesting to see how that narrative develops. Fiscal still kind of charging ahead in terms of the money that it's delivering for the U.S. economy. But maybe on the monetary side, we start to see action, maybe to rein in some of the stimulus that has already been delivered and continues to be delivered in size by the Fed, Taylor. Good point. Maybe that's why you're up eight basis points on the day to a 194 guy. Inflationary yep. effects. I hear it is transitory. Ha, we'll wait and see. Um, while the president was speaking, we got a Bloomberg scoop, which we did flash across the bottom of the screen for you. Uh, it is going to be critical to many that are watching this program. The EU apparently looking to decide potentially in a meeting next week uh, to remove the U.S. from its free travel list as a result of the case count that we are now seeing, and the president mentioning that in the United States. Let's dig into this. I, at the moment, we're still waiting to find exactly find out exactly what this is going to mean. Bloomberg, Siddharth Philip joining me on set. What do we know? So at the moment, it's still unclear what the rules are going to be, but since the U.S. cases have been rising, the European Union is saying that it's beyond that threshold for quarantine-free travel. So we're still looking to see what that means for vaccinated travelers and everything else. But it does seem like a bad idea for the airlines, especially uh, Lufthansa and others who have been counting on American tourists coming into the EU, as well as a reopening from the other end uh, for the U.S. to reopen to European and U.K. travelers. I, I think what's interesting, though, is you think about March 2020. They said, let's just shut down for two weeks because we're ignoring cases. It's about hospitalizations. It's about deaths, right? So why the restrictions if the whole point was just to help reduce the load and the overcapacity in hospitalizations? So the European Union has a threshold of 75 cases per 100,000 that it sort of applies as this benchmark to allow for quarantine-free travel. And what's the, uh, the, since the U.S. has exceeded that threshold, essentially they're saying that quarantine-free travel may not be available. I mean, we are still going to see travel, but the, uh, the idea that Americans could come into the European Union and not have to quarantine is essentially might be going away. One of the things that has annoyed many in Brussels and other capitals around Europe is that there's been no reciprocity. Absolutely. I mean, and, and you wonder whether this has got something to do with this. Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, the U.S. obviously hasn't really lifted the curbs, and the airlines and everybody else have been lobbying furiously to try and get those curbs removed, especially during the busy summer season. And that hasn't happened. And as a result, airlines have only been able to fly tourists in one way. And now, with the door closing, I mean, it looks pretty grim at the moment. Sid, we'll look for the updates, we'll look for the details. Thank you very much indeed for bringing us this breaking news. Bloomberg Siddharth Philip on a decision, a big decision that could come out of Europe next week. Let's take a look at where European markets have finished. Uh, the president was speaking as we had the European close. It's been an incredibly positive week for European equities. Today, actually, by and large, flatlining. We had this incredibly positive payroll story out of the United States, Taylor. But in reality, actually, that didn't move the needle much when it came to European equities. But the earnings story has been very positive. I think this has been the best week for European stocks since March. 
despite even some of the supply chain issues that we continue to talk about within the world of logistics, Guy, we're going to do all of that next with Stevan Sieber, Transporian CEO, on that global logistics industry and, of course, some of those rising freight costs. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Let's talk about some of the corporate results we've had today. The CEO of the shipping giant, AP Muller Maersk, uh, telling us that the outlook for the third quarter is, quote, strong. Freight rates continue to keep rising, at least when it comes to container shipping. For more now on what's happening with the global logistics industry, which is so critical to this inflation narrative that we're debating at the moment. Uh, Stephen Sieber, the CEO of Transporian, which analyzes all this data. AP Muller Maersk, pretty positive. Stefan, in terms of where it sees the numbers going, what is your estimate about how sustainable these current high freight rates are? What does it look like going forward for the next few months? Well, specifically for the ocean, for the ocean mode, we don't expect this to change for quite a while. I, I do think, you know, probably in 22, second half of 22, this will potentially loosen up a bit, but until it flips in the market, it will take a much, much longer time. So I, I'm not surprised by the forecast that AP Miller gave today. When do you see a return to normalization in some of these rates and the healing of the supply chain? Well, you know, that, that depends on many things because for the last 18 months, actually quite a number of times we thought that this is a perfect storm, right? We've seen ever given in the Suez Canal. We've seen the first wave of and the second wave of COVID hitting us. We've seen Brexit happening. Uh, and, and we always thought that this is a perfect storm. But what is happening right now seems to be much more, uh, you know, broad. It's almost like an El Nino. And, and it's so interconnected, right? We, we just heard about, uh, you know, the economy picking up in the U.S., uh, President Biden giving this address on these uh, pretty strong uh, data from the labor market. But then we've also heard about these potential travel restrictions, right? And this is all impacting freight rates, right? The economy is picking up. It's still very volatile, depending on, you know, what happens with the Delta variant and potentially new uh, virus strains that are coming up. Uh, but then we also hear things like travel restrictions that take away belly capacity from the airline industry. That, again, makes, you know, the market more tight. Price elasticity goes down. Rates go up. So it's all somehow connected. And, and as we have many moving parts and nobody is really knowing what comes, um, you know, yeah. it's difficult to predict how long this will take. Stefan, where are the current big bottlenecks? Is it a lack of containers because all of the traffic is going from China to the United States and Europe? Is it truck drivers? Is it like, ships? Where, where are the big bottlenecks that, that you see kind of sticking around and, and not being resolved for a while? You know, Guy, this is, it's, it's all of what you said, right? I mean, it starts with there is a supply bottleneck, right? Uh, and, and this is not only for semiconductors, it's also for pretty, pretty uh, uh, commodity goods like wood and chip board, right? Everything is tight. That forces shippers to ship stuff, ships, ship goods on unusual lanes. These unusual lanes are hitting a tight capacity market in both absolute capacity, which is down because, for example, in air freight, I just said there are less planes flying around. And, and the ocean market has been tight already before the crisis. But also the dynamic capacity is down because everything takes more time, right? Because of mm. testing regulation, changing regulations, etc. And at the same time, the economy is picking up. So pretty much on all the sides of the equation, we see bottlenecks at the moment. On that note, it was interesting. Guy mentioned that the U.S. is just importing to, from China. We had a record trade deficit this week. Do you see that as continuing, or is this a one-time blip of the U.S. refilling inventory, restocking the shelves, and you get a reversion back to the mean? Uh, I actually think it's quite sustainable, right? That money that President Biden just announced to be spending, that needs to, come, to go somewhere and, and people want to buy, buy things and invest. Uh, so from that point of view, I think this is more than just a one-time effect. Just in terms of the supply side, whatever is being made there, are we building more containers? Are we building more ships? What can be done there? Is that something the industry wants to do? 
yeah absolutely i mean again it depends a little bit on the on the uh, on the transport mode but clearly in the land transport in in europe we see that many carriers are waiting on new trucks unfortunately the semiconductor shortage is 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 holding those trucks back from being delivered uh, in the ocean industry, we see that also new ships have been ordered, but we see that it's only 2020, sort of second half of 2022, 2023, that the new ships come into the market. That's the downside, right? This, this supply side on the capacity is relatively slow moving. And, and, and while the ocean market was already tight uh, uh, before the pandemic, because of that, uh, low capacity, actually, mm. the opportunistic freight has moved out of the market already. So, for example, waste paper, uh, you, 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 just, you just store it, uh, but the remaining market is much less price elasticity. That means prices go up. Elasticity, we could do it all day. Stefan Sieber, really appreciate your time. Transporian CEO. Guy, I want to pivot. Another big story today we haven't covered yet and we need to. Russian court found American private equity investor Michael Galvey guilty of embezzlement. This is more than two years after he was arrested in a case that really highlights the dangers of operating in Russia. Let's do more with Christopher Granville, T.S. Lombard Managing Director for EMEA and Global Political Research. Christopher, what does this highlight about the increasing investing risks now really hitting, well, the corporate and the financial world? Well, I think it's it's more a, a kind of very revealing snapshot of realities uh, rather than uh, telling experienced investors in Russia anything they didn't really know, but very revealing and very sobering for the following reason, that Michael Calvi and uh, a group of fellow managers of the Bering Vostok private equity fund have been convicted on charges which are clearly unfounded. Now, that may just sound like me stress making an opinion, but... It is absolutely clear, and I would say you don't even have to take it from me. Uh, President Putin's own ombudsman for business, Mr. Boris Titov, uh, says so in public. So uh, you just have a, a snapshot of the courtroom, which you can see on your screen, on your showing now, Michael Calvi stepping out of, mm. uh, upholding the judge, upholding whatever the prosecution side says. And uh, that really... Uh, is no one needs to know that the rule of law is uh, very weak in Russia and that investors um, are vulnerable. But it, as I said, it's one of those uh, kind of revealing snapshots, which uh, I think uh, are you no know, need to be taken note of. Michael has to wait. We still don't have sentencing, Christopher. How critical a moment is that going to be? Found guilty of embezzlement, denies the charges, as you say, most people, in, in the community, the business community in Russia, see this uh, as something of a travesty of justice. But how critical is sentencing going to be? Uh, he was arrested. He was under house arrest. Uh, he was released from that. How critical is this next moment? Uh, well, Guy, you put your finger on the, the big question. And, and I was rather uh, expecting, even hoping, for the purposes of our chat today, uh, that this news would have broken by now, because... Uh, the judge, when delivering yesterday's guilty verdict, said that today would be, uh, she would follow up today with the sentencing. And we haven't had the news yet, and it's already a late hour in Moscow, so that looks like it may be slipping. But, you know, Guy, there is no suspense. Uh, Michael Calvi and his fellow defendants will not do any real jail time. The prosecutor has requested suspended prison sentences, and we can be, I think, extremely confident that the judge will agree with the prosecutor. And this will kind of come across the compromise. Uh, you know that uh, the, the, the law enforcement machine could not lose face, but they're kind of admitting that their case wasn't that strong because no one's going to jail. And you know, the idea is we can all move on from there. And I'm sure that will be the spin that we'll see from uh, various officials in Moscow, perhaps indeed the Kremlin spokesman uh, him, uh, himself. But you know, there's a very bad taste left by this. There's no question. Uh, not least that Michael Calvi you know, did several months in pre-trial detention, and some yep. of his fellow defendants, especially the Russian ones, as a Christopher, we will wait that news. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Before we get it, Christopher Granville of TS Lombard, thank you very much indeed. That wraps things up for Taylor and for me. Uh, joining.
David Weston on Balance of Power, uh, Senator John Ossoff uh, of Georgia uh, joining the team, discussing, obviously, this key vote that is coming up this weekend. I'm going off to the cable, Bloomberg DAB Digital Radio. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.